Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second annual Edward Kremer Seminar on the History of Pharmacy and Drugs. My name is Claire Clark. I'm an Associate Professor of Behavioral Science at the University of Kentucky, which is co-hosting the seminar this year, along with the University of Wisconsin, the American Institute of the History of Pharmi Pharmacy, AIHP, the Alcohol and the Alcohol and Drugs History Society, ADHS. It's my privilege to introduce this year's seminar, which we are sort of fondly calling after AIHP co-founder Edward Kremers, the Kremenar. Um, the Kremers was the second Dean of Pharmacy at the University of Wisconsin. He co-founded the American Institute of Pharmacy in 1941. He pushed for humanistic approaches within health sciences and professional education, and also believed that we needed to be open-minded when developing policies related to substances and American society. So um, the talks are all in this spirit. Um, last year, um, Professor Luke Rickert um, and AIHP in Wisconsin launched the Kreminar as a way to achieve uh, several goals for folks interested in the history of pharmacy, um, medicines, intoxicants, drugs, whichever sort of label you prefer, the Kreminar has a talk for you. Um, Professor Rickert, the historical director of the American Institute of Pharmacy, launched the seminar series to help build community among early career and established scholars, share insights between folks who um, study different time periods and disciplines, advance scholarship, generate new ideas. And we're also hoping um, at the same time to promote a broader understanding of both substances and of pharmacy and pharmaceutical history to a more general audience. So our theme this year is opiates and opioids. Um, the contemporary opioid crisis is obviously front page news. Has a it has a very complicated backstory. The Kreminar this year is an opportunity for us to think about opiates and opioids, both globally and locally, and to consider possible future solutions to the opioid crisis in historical context. So joining me today is my co-host, Luke Rickert. I think he... There he is, hi. <laughs> um, and our moderator, Dr. Jonathan Jones. Hello. Um, it's been delightful working with both of them. Our deepest thanks. So I have to thank a few people before I introduce our speaker. Um, thanks go out to many people at the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy who are making this happen behind the scenes as I speak. At our respective institutions, Luke and I are grateful for the support of Wisconsin's Department of History and Department of Medical History and Bioethics, and to the University of Kentucky's Department of Behavioral Science and um, Arts and Sciences Cooperative for the Humanities and Social Sciences. So with that, I'd like to offer a very warm welcome to our second, to our, uh, our Kreminar speaker, Dr. James Bradford. So James Bradford is just recently promoted. He is an associate professor of liberal arts and sciences at Berkeley College of Music. And he is also the author of this wonderful book, Poppies, Politics and Power, Afghanistan and the Global History of Drugs and Diplomacy, which he'll be talking about today. So with that, I will um, turn the floor over. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see all of you over Zoom. Um, I am, I, I am going to try very hard to not talk forever, um, because I can talk a lot about it, but, um, I want to, uh, again, sort of thank everyone for the sponsorship of this and, um, and for, for having me here and, and for sort of talking about what I think is a re really sort of important, um, and understudied element of not only the history of drugs, but I think just sort of drugs in general, um, so I am, I, I know that everyone's sort of tired of uh, PowerPoints as am I, as I gave a lot of them over the past semester. Um, so I am going to, uh, but I am gonna show you some pictures and I wanna sort of use these pictures as a way to, to sort of discuss um, the history that I wrote and also sort of describe uh, and, and I think maybe sort of ruminate, I guess, in the end of sort of the, the, the contemporary consequences um, of what's unfolded here. Um, so um, let me just sort of share the screen so we can all sort of see it um, and get forward. So um, 
so I'm actually, I'm going to start with this picture here uh, and sort of preface, uh, I guess, sort of a, a little bit of my, my own sort of journey uh, into this. When I started as a graduate student and, and started studying drugs uh, in Afghanistan, I ended up with um, really sort of um, kind of a paradox in sort of my approach to this country and to this topic because and I think that this image here encapsulates it. So this is um, this image here, this is Dar al Aman Palace, and this is in the west of Kabul. It's by the parliament building. It was built in the 1920s by Amanullah Khan. And it's, um, it was a beautiful, beautiful building. It was sort of had this sort of German style architecture. Uh, and it was really sort of seen as a indicative of Afghanistan's sort of ascension into yeah, so the modern world, I guess. And, um, and what was interesting for me as a, as a historian and was that much of what I was studying and learning uh, reflected this history and what the sort of the, the foundations of this building, right? It's this idea of the sort of, um, you know, Afghanistan in the 20s saw itself as sort of, you know, emerging in the world and, you know, yeah, and sort of capturing that moment along with other Muslim countries such as Iran, Reza Khan, as well as, uh, you know, Ataturk and Turkey. But then at the same time, if you look closely at that picture, you can see that it's, it's, it's not under construction. Uh, it has been destroyed. And so in that one sense where, you know, my approach as a historian was sort of looking at this history of, of Afghanistan as sort of a stable place with a rich history, it was also sort of confronting this reality of this place, which was at the time, you know, 30 years into war. And, you know, at this juncture, we're talking, you know, over 40 years of conflict. And so for me, it was this really interesting, again, sort of paradox of this, this Afghanistan that I knew historically, that I understood historically. And the difference with what it was projected as. Um, and, and in that sense, it became a really interesting way for me to really sort of think about drugs, the drug trade and drug policy in, in this country. Um, and it was, it, and, and, and to sort of put it in, in different words was, I could not avoid the, the obvious in this, which was Afghanistan has in many ways been defined by the drug trade and by war and by chaos. And so for me, it was sort of responding to this and to sort of finding a way to sort of recast and rethink not only the history of Afghanistan, but also what that sort of tells us about the now, right? And to sort of challenge, I think, some of these very powerful um, sort of stereotypes and tropes that have come to define Afghanistan. And again, a lot of this is um, the idea of a stateless, lawless place um, that didn't fit with what I knew about this country. So in terms of sort of just the more sort of specific uh, sort of drug elements that I was sort of digging into and sort of confronting, which was the fact that Afghanistan has been the, one of the largest, obviously the largest producer of illicit drugs uh, and illicit heroin, particularly in the world, um, anywhere from 80 to 90 percent. It's uh, a huge feature of the rural economy. Um, it's a, a major driver of, of labor. Um, and it's it's one of those things where almost every country that surrounds Afghanistan has been influenced by the drug trade. And you've seen, you know, increases in, in addiction in, in Pakistan, India, in Iran, as well as in um, Central Asia and in Russia. And a lot of it is, um, you know, comes from Afghanistan. So it was one of those things where for me, I was, I was sort of wondering, how do we get to this place? And as I started to study Afghanistan and not only the history of it, but also the, the drug trade, it was, there was something that really sort of jumped out at me, which was that um, there was really, there was no history. There, there, was, there, was, there was nothing that sort of explained in a substantial way, the history of, of opium or cannabis or just drugs in general prior to the Afghan Soviet war in 1979. And so for me, I sort of saw this as, as obviously an opportunity um, and you know, it was, it was quite curious about why, why does, why, why do we not understand what's happening prior to this sort of defining sort of event and process of the last 40 years. And so in that sense, um, 
you know, I saw some really big problems with the historiography or lack thereof. And that was, you know, there's, there's a ton of stuff and it's almost all sort of focused on 1979 to the present, but really sort of post 9-11, right? Sort of post uh, sort of U.S. invasion in 2001. Uh, and, and that's not to, to discount this work because a lot of it is fantastic. Um, but it was largely focusing and sort of, you know, taking these ideas about the drug trade and re sort of reinforcing the, the, the elements of that the drug trade was tied to statelessness, statelessness, lawlessness, chaos, war, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in that sense, I, I really felt sort of emboldened to recapture the history. And, and I'm not alone in this as in terms of sort of Afghan history. There, there's been some really fantastic work in recent years about either complicating or, or reassessing um, and reimagining Afghan history um, and, and to, to sort of rediscover it in this sense. There was also another element of this too, which was that as I dug into this history more, I realized that there, there was just the looming presence of the US and, and the war on drugs. And you know, I would sort of think about this when, if, if you read the CIGAR report, which is the Special Inspector General of Afghan Reconstruction, which has you know, you know, quarterly reports on reconstruction in Afghanistan. You know, and you're talking billions of dollars uh, that go into counter narcotics programs and, and, and the amount of, of resources that have been poured into this country in the last you know 20 years to to uh, understand in the most basic sense what's going on but also to to change it and to stop it um and in that sense uh, again it was th there was this sort of looming presence for me which was you know why did we not understand what happened prior to 1979 and in what ways does this history that i was uncovering maybe force us to rethink the approach uh, toward drugs in response to you know, drug policy uh, in this regard. So um, I, you know, it was really in many ways just, just kind of trying to sort of think about sort of how did they like, you know, take this image here, sort of why did they build this building? Why did this building occur? What was, what was the symbolism of this? And sort of applying that in a way to sort of the history of drugs, sort of thinking about what then went on here with the construction of the drug trade, of drug policy, and how and in what ways was that shaped by domestic politics and international politics? And trying to sort of situate this um, in a way that really sort of reflected um, a, a history that was lost. And so in terms of the approaches to this, um, a, a lot of this was, it was recognizing the fact that Afghanistan was you know, even though I was sort of approaching this from a sort of nationalist and a nation state perspective, um, that was obviously incomplete. Um, I'll give you a brief story about this. I was at, I was at a talk of, uh, at the, the Kennedy School many years ago when I was a graduate student. And there were a series of uh, UN figures there and some from the U.S. government. And they were talking about drug eradication programs. And they kept talking about successful programs in the Nangarhar province, which is just um, east of Kabul. And someone asked this question that seemed very obvious, but it didn't really have an answer, which was, well, that's great that these programs seem successful, but what about next, what about the next province? What about in Pakistan? And in what ways has what's happened in Afghanistan shifted those dynamics in these other countries because these borders are porous. And so in that sense, you know, it seemed obvious and, 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 and there was sort of a struggle to answer this question and obviously a recognition of the limitations of this. So for me, it was sort of trying to sort of understand that even as looking at Afghanistan and the history of drugs in Afghanistan, it was also sort of thinking about the ways in which Afghanistan was influenced by these, these global forces. And in turn, the ways in which these global forces were influenced by Afghanistan. So I kind of processed in sort of two, two ways, um, which was sort of the first one, and, and they're, I guess they're sort of mutually constitutive, they're sort of entangled, and I, and, and I try to sort of parse this out, and I don't, I don't think you can really sort of, you know, put the cart before the horse with either of them in, in, in some ways. But in, in one ways, I was looking at the global drug trade, and this was really sort of thinking about, you know, Al McCoy's book, The Politics of Heroin, and sort of thinking about sort of the, the interconnections of this massive sort of ecosystem of drugs. 
And and that way I was trying to sort of figure out, you know, because, it, you know, when you read this book, you, you, you know, there's obviously, you know, I think there's, you know, maybe a couple pages on sort of pre-1979 and then, you know, expands a great deal about what happens post-war. But I was also trying to sort of figure out, well, what is it then that, that entangles Afghanistan and the drug trade? Like, what, what is it? What are the pieces of this that sort of bring this country and these regions of this country into the fold, either in the legal drug trade or in the illicit drug trade? And so I, I was trying to sort of parse that out um, quite a bit. Um, and in turn, like I was saying, it was also about what then does Afghanistan do? To the drug trade? How does it influence global shifts in dynamics and production and trafficking and also consumption? Um, and in that sense, sort of recognizing, I guess, in some ways, sort of the agency of this place in, in shaping drug markets and the drug trade. So that was sort of the one element of it. The other element was thinking, obviously, about drug policy and was thinking about what about the, the, the response to this um, and thinking about um, how did Afghanistan um, shape or why did it pass drug policies and drug control measures? And what shape did they take? And of course, why? Um, and in that way, you know, it's, it's taking sort of these global ambitions of international drug control and thinking about the ways in which they manifest domestically and internally and trying to sort of think about how that expression of power on a global scale then gets internalized and, and, and sort of refabricated in the Afghan context. But also, as I said before, given the fact that Afghanistan also has a presence and an influence in the drug trade, it's also th sort of thinking about the manners in which it too shaped responses of international drug control, in this case, really sort of US drug control and trying to respond to these conditions of the drug, of the drug trade in Afghanistan. So I was very much trying to sort of balance this, this, these, really sort of big movements and sort of global history and changes with what's happening in this country and sort of thinking about, um, and in some cases sort of responding to, and this is, uh, you know, Isaac Campos and Paul Gutenberg wrote about this a, a couple of years ago about, and particularly in addressing US war on drugs was in what, way, in what ways did the war on drugs or drug control shape this country, but also the limitations of this, right? And sort of seeing what then does that tell us about, you know, this picture about Afghanistan and the building of the state. And I think that was sort of the big thing. And so ultimately what, what my, in a very interesting way was that my book and my research were largely bringing the state back in and in a way in which was really sort of directly confronting these very powerful tropes about Afghanistan as the stateless, lawless place. And for me to sort of be like, well, wait a minute, if, if I'm sort of looking at this history, there's clearly a state influence and there's clearly there, there's something going on here that was sort of contending against with sort of the, the, these sort of bigger ideas that had come to really sort of define um, Afghanistan in sort of the contemporary way. So, um, you know, long story short, I'll just sort of go quickly over sort of the methodology, but, you know, a lot of this was, there was no history. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to lie, the first couple of years as, it, you know, post comps, I was, I was uh, lost <laughs> and I was digging through archival material, had, had no idea where I was going and trying desperately to, to find material um, and struggled because I, I wasn't really responding to anything. I was, I was kind of just, you know, searching in a room for a, a story that that I didn't even know if it existed um, but it did and so you know a lot of this was you know certainly derived from uh, U.S. archives and and there are certainly U.S. documents which pertain to sort of diplomatic issues related to drug control there was also stuff from the Library of Congress which had some great diary language materials from the Afghan government and newspapers um, and also uh, sort of offsetting that with materials that I got from research in Afghanistan 2014 from the Archive of Mili, uh, the National Archives, um, the Public Library, and also some really great um, um, sort of research institutions in Kabul, the, the Afghan Research and Evaluation Unit, the AREU, um, and the Afghan Center, the Afghanistan Center at Kabul University, which has been really sort of this very substantial uh, digitization project um, and archive that was led by really sort of the, the great Nancy Dupree. So um, these, this was sort of the basis of this. Uh, and, there, and there were other archives too. I, I spent a, a good deal sort of traveling all over the place for this. Um, 
and, and you know, obviously there were some issues with with um, with the story that I'm writing. And I think in some ways I, I was sort of heartened by uh, reading Ryan Gingeris's work on Turkey and sort of recognizing um, to how to sort of, you know, what story can I tell from these sources and also what can I not tell, right? And what, what are the limitations of this? And so there's certainly sort of a limited Afghan, um, which I try to peel out as much as I can. Um, and also, as we, we get later, uh, um, part of this is because Afghanistan doesn't have a very uh, solid infrastructure for, for archival research. This has changed. It's actually gotten much better. Um, but also because, as you see in the picture there, 40 years of war. Um, and there's been some significant challenges in that regard. So in terms of those approaches, um, I think sort of the big thing that, that sort of was the, the focal point of, of my research, as I said before, was... Um, was that drug control was tied to the formation of the Afghan state. And it was, and I think in a deeper vein, it was really, and what I was looking for was the manners in which drug control was used to legitimize state authority. And why that was important is because in Afghan political culture, there is, uh, there is division and there is conflict between rural authority and rural power and state power, which is largely born out of urban communities, and particularly Kabul. And so for me, it was sort of thinking about the manners in which drug control sort of was indicative and represented um, not only attempts to sort of, and on the like surface level, sort of, you know, shaping and curbing drug production or trade, but also sort of the deeper sort of meanings behind that and symbolism behind that, in which drug control was tied to um, you know, the deeper legacies and histories between the state and these communities. So there's a couple of ways that I went about this uh, in terms of sort of thinking about drug control tied to state formation. That's kind of going to be sort of the basis of the talk today. And I'll sort of, in sort of breaking it down in sort of two ways, um, which also, also sort of reflect um, much of sort of the sort of three quarter century history that I wrote, which was that for the first half of the 20th century, Afghanistan was trying to be a legal trader of opium uh, and, and was growing opium for the global market and was even pursuing um, essentially ratification to be uh, a, a legal producer of drugs um, for, for pharmaceutical companies. And in this sense, that carried with it these elements of, of modernization and sort of, of course, sort of the, problem, you know, the problematic elements of that. Um, but sort of these, these bigger ambitions of sort of building sort of th these aspects that were indicative of modernization, hospitals and infrastructure and all these sort of things and medicine and, and these concepts. And, and I'll get into this a little bit later about sort of the problems that come out of that, about this. Um, and then in turn, um, in sort of the second half of my book, I sort of focus on really sort of drug control as a way to suppress the drug trade. And this is really where you have this shift from the legal drug trade to sort of the illegal and the illicit. Um, and in this case, drugs go from being a, 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 a tied to state formation through essentially sort of economic development and exports in, in the most basic sense to tied to diplomacy, tied to policing tied to more essentially sort of coercive forms of drug control and and there's and, and sort of limitations of those as we go in and so i see this sort of uh, um sort of thinking about sort of kathleen friedel's book where she talked about the drug wars in the u.s and sort of thought about sort of the war on drugs as kind of a modality of power the manner in which it's sort of utilized um to to sort of push groups to to really sort of emphasize state power um, was a way for me to sort of think about this in Afghanistan. It's a way in which the state was using um, new approaches to drug control, not in this case as a, a vehicle for legal production and export, but rather uh, as a way um, to exercise sort of the illegality of the drugs um, and suppression of production. So that was sort of really war major one influence of this. And as a result of this, the U.S. has a really big role. Um, and certainly the U.S., um, you know, historically has, has been one of the major players in the international drug control regime in the 20th century. And but what was really interesting for me was that the U.S. has also been a really important diplomatic partner for Afghanistan since World War II and not just since 9-11. And that was something that was really uh, very interesting for me was sort of thinking about Afghanistan and the U.S. relationship. And in this way, the U.S. has this 
really central role because the U.S. in one sense is buying these drugs legally, but then also in turn later in the century starts to become a really big figure in encouraging and helping Afghanistan become, uh, you know, helping them sort of suppress the drug trade. So in this sense, there was a, a, a you know, a, a way of sort of bringing in U.S. Afghan diplomacy, and I thought the that the book really sort of highlighted the manner in which um, this became, you know, drugs became a really important part of this relationship um, in an interesting way, which is also sort of interesting parallel to now, given that this is still uh, an important part of this relationship. Um, and so I think ultimately my research, and I'm going to sort of come back to this point at the end, um, was I, I was really sort of thinking about the manners in which drugs and I say, I mean that broadly with the drug trade and drug policy was tied to governance. And I think in the most basic sense. And, and um, so in that way, sort of the manners in which not only is drug policy responding to the drug trade, but how is it also influencing the politics and social dynamics of this country that may in, in, in an interesting way um, actually exacerbate or create the conditions which help the drug trade expand further. Um, and so in that way, it was, it was kind of sort of avoiding the sort of binary of sort of thinking about drugs and, and drug policy as sort of, you know, as, is essentially mutually exclusive, but actually thinking about them tied together and the manners in which they exacerbate some of the deeper political and social issues in Afghanistan. Um, and I think some of, you know, it's interesting to think about this because I've been to the last couple of talks here in the Kremlinar, and I think there's ultimately been this big discussion, right, about sort of this abandoning this sort of binary, the legal and the illegal, and sort of thinking about the ways in which they interconnect. And, and I saw that quite a bit in Afghanistan, and I'll expand upon that. So um, I'm going to sort of talk here about uh, maybe some of the little bit more specifics about what, what's going on uh, in Afghanistan in those sort of two ways. Um, so I'll sort of talk first here about what was happening sort of the late 19th century, late, late, uh, late 1800s, early 20th century, up to about World War II. Um, his Afghanistan was really trying to sort of ride the wave of the colonial drug trade. Um, British India, of course, obviously um, had, had grown relatively dependent on, on opium as well as, as cannabis, um, as agricultural goods to be taxed. And what was really interesting was that um, under Abdul Rahman Khan, who was in many cases really one of the, the most significant sort of uh, kings in the history of Afghanistan, because he really sort of, he basically mapped out the geography, the, the sort of boundaries of the state we see today, you know, with the Duran line, 1893, and sort of, um, sort of giving it shape uh, and sort of defining these boundaries. Um, but also Amanullah Khan, who was um, the, the big figure um, that we see in, in this, this photo of the palace, um, were that they both saw the drug trade as really essential to the development of their state in, in two very interesting ways. So in the first way, um, they wanted to capture that export market. And so both of them advocated farmers to bring drugs into South Asia and to bring it into the subcontinent and, and basically capture some of the capital um, that, was, that existed in a much wealthier part of the world. And so it was really, really interesting is that over time, uh, really by the time we get into the 1900s, Afghan drugs really start to uh, become increasingly prevalent on sort of the border regions uh, and even parts of Northwest, what is now sort of Northwest India. Um, and in that sense, it was, it was quite interesting because uh, this is sort of um, you know, typical uh, of, of Afghan traders um, was that they, they were quite keen and many of them were essentially smuggling these goods to uh, because British drugs, opium and hashish were taxed heavily. And so Afghan traders were in essence circumventing taxation and smuggling these drugs in so that they weren't paying British taxes so that they could compete better. And what was really interesting about this is that this was largely advocated by the state. Um, uh, Amanullah Khan is, and Abdul Rahman Khan, both of them saw this as a way to essentially extract the capital that existed in the subcontinent and bring it back. And so that was really interesting to me because both of these rulers, of course, were really sort of major figures in the sort of early development of the Afghan state. What's also interesting about this is, and it's more obvious, and this is, you see this with Amanullah Khan, where laws discouraging use domestically. 
And now there's not a lot of information about what was, what was going on, were the problems with drug use, were, were, were people, you know, were, was he responding to like conditions of, you know, opium addiction, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's no evidence of this, well, at least not yet. Um, but what was, what was fascinating about this was that this really sort of indicated that the state had sort of recognized, well, there's, there's potential here with these goods. Let's export these goods. Let's encourage the exports of these goods so that traders will sell these goods and bring that money back to Afghanistan. How domestic use, we're going to discourage the use of this. Now, there's, there's a couple other sort of important notes about this that were important because in one sense, the British respond to this, and, and I argue this in the book, that, that, the, the, that Afghan drugs really sort of have a, a pretty big influence at sort of shaping and deterring the sort of perpetuation of the legal drug trade in, in British India. Obviously, there's a, few, a whole array of other factors, but uh, in the context of what's happening in the Northwest frontier, um, Afghanistan and Afghan drugs were becoming a problem uh, to the point where uh, there was very little sort of formal solutions uh, in that regard. But domestically in Afghanistan, what was also interesting was that this drugs were tied then to sort of the broader process of the, the building of the modern state under Amanullah Khan, which of course his rule lasted nine years, 1928, he's overthrown uh, when he leaves the country. And even though Amanullah is sort of seen as the great modernizer of the country, that also is sort of symbolic of the attempts of the state to project authority in the country and particularly in, in places, you know, even in Kabul and, and possibly outside, because we don't know the sort of at, like the actual consequences of this, but certainly the symbolism of it. Um, now, what's also really interesting about this is that this sort of continues in and in a, in a, in a, as things shift. Uh, and by the time we get to the 1930s and 1940s, um, and, and essentially Afghanistan becomes a, a you know, more and more a Afghan, uh, there's actually three government Afghan uh, opium companies that start to sell drugs, sell opium to Western pharmaceutical companies. And this is a really sort of interesting element is that they start to sell for the sort of quasi legal market. Um, and what I found to be most interesting is that by the time we get to World War II, uh, 41 and 42, uh, and really by 43, the United States becomes one of the, the significant buyers of Afghan opium. They really loved it, which was, uh, I found to be really interesting because Afghanistan, particularly opium from Badakhshan, which is in the north east of the country, which I'll show you in, in, in just a second. The opium there is, is really superior. It is you know, high morphine content. So pharmaceutical companies really prized this uh, opium because it was you know, essentially in terms of just weight, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're maximizing the amount of drug that you're actually getting out of this. But the problem that also came with this sort of tied to sort of the broader ambitions of having a more sort of standardized uh, drug system and drug regulatory system in which the purchasing and buying of goods was done very much by the book. And Afghans were most certainly not done by the book. Uh, in fact, there's a, a little anecdote I put in the book where w there's one time where uh, one of the Western companies buys opium and, and the Afghans give them a little extra on top as an incentive. And of course, the American the, the, the pharmaceutical companies are like, that's great. Thank you. Um, but this is also not by the book. Like there's, 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 a, you know, there's more weight here than we bought. Um, and while we thank you, um, you know, regulators were like, this is not good. This is, you know, you need to play by the book. So what's important about that, um, it was the legal sale. There was an ambition here. And this is an ambition that still exists. I, I actually saw this even in interviews with people was that, you know, why can't Afghanistan be a producer of legal drugs to this day? Um, and certainly an interesting question. Um, but what was also problematic about this relationship was that Afghanistan was selling raw opium to the world. But in terms of buying modern drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, manufactured narcotics, they had to purchase them. So you sort of think about this for a minute, essentially Afghanistan's selling the raw goods and then being half the, you know, having to buy, you know, the manufactured goods. I mean, this is sort of like typical colonialism. And so this was, this did not sit well with the Afghans. This was something that they expressed deeply to a variety of countries that this is unfair. We, we should be able to produce and manufacture our goods and we wanna be able to produce our own uh, medicines for our hospitals or their lack thereof. And ultimately what happens in 1944 is largely under pressure from the United States as well as others is that the, is the US convinces Afghanistan to prohibit government production of opium. 
1945, this ban goes into effect. And in exchange, the United States formalizes its diplomatic relationship. So prior to this period, the U.S. is essentially all of those sort of, you know, all diplomacy is operated at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, in, in Iran. And so this was big. It was essentially using diplomacy as a tool to convince Afghanistan to prohibit drugs. Now, what's really fascinating about this, let's sort of move on, is that uh, Afghanistan announces this in the, in the newspaper, uh, but never goes into legislation. Nothing actually ever happens. You know, essentially, uh, two of the government companies closed down. One of them apparently kept selling. And by the time we get to the late 1940s, uh, British uh, officials are going to the U.S. saying, hey, they're still selling opium to other countries. And, you know, France reported this. So what was really important about this is that Afghanistan really never abandoned that ambition for illegal drug trade. They continued throughout the 1950s. And in 1953, Mohammed Daoud Khan, who's sort of the strongman of the Musahiban dynasty and the Musahiban dynasty who essentially governs Afghanistan from sort of 1929 to, to 78, but really, you know, sort of, you know, 33 is when it's sort of firmly established. Um, but Mohammed Daoud Khan is sort of the strong man, uh, comes in power in 1953. And he was very much sort of this uh, individual sort of playing the Cold War game uh, and, and sort of operating this sort of neutrality that sort of defined Afghanistan throughout this period. And he really is pressuring the United States to support uh, essentially ratification to be a legal producer of opium for pharmaceutical industries. And throughout the 1950s, this debate goes on and on. In fact, Harry Anslinger himself actually thought this might even be a, a rational idea, which of course is interesting. But this is where Afghanistan's sort of hierarchy within the diplomatic sort of system comes into play. Basically, Afghanistan's still sort of a backwater compared to Pakistan and Iran, which are still sort of key U.S. partners. And Iran is already experimenting with its own issues with, with uh, drug policy and, and trying to sort of figure this issue out. And this is what sort of comes into play is that as Iran is trying to sort of control its drug use, Afghan opium starts to make its way into Iran. And ultimately what happens is in this debate over legal opium, Iran starts to get in the ear and say, look, if they can't control their trade, they shouldn't be allowed to do this. Uh, they should not be allowed to, to, to be a legal producer, that they have to demonstrate control. Um, and so in a really sort of abrupt announcement, in the end of 1957, uh, Mohammed Daoud Khan announces a nationwide ban of opium. But what's most significant about this is that this ban will go into effect in one province. There are four major provinces that were growing opium during this period. But Badakhshan was the biggest one. This is where opium was largely monocropped. It was, it was seen as sort of essentially the poorest uh, uh, province in the country. Um, but what was really interesting about this was that this was really some brilliant politicking on the part of Mohammed Daoud Khan because Western pharmaceutical companies all knew about Badakhshan. They were all well aware of this, this province. And so there was a, a bit of... of sort of sympathy that was generated and sort of the plight of the Afghans for doing this, for enacting this. And actually, there's a great deal of pressure on Anzalgar himself saying, look, you basically encourage Afghanistan to prohibit and eradicate the crop in the poorest province of Afghanistan, of which they have nothing else. So throughout this period, throughout 1958, when the ban goes into effect and actually eradicate crops, as it says, estimated 100,000 people are affected by this. Um, it becomes this an example of the manners in which drug control, in this case, an eradication program, were tied to these issues of state formation in Afghanistan and also diplomacy. Obviously, as it goes into Badakhshan, there's this big issue about, you know, why are you doing this? You know, is it, is it necessary for international drug control to really sort of suppress drugs in a poor province like Badakhshan, which has nothing else? But internally, it was actually even more significant because Badakhshan was inhabited by ethnic minorities. And why that was significant was this ban did not go into effect in those other provinces that grew opium. It only went to an effect here. And this is where it sort of fits into the contours of Afghan political culture, whereby there was always during this period a reluctance to exacerbate tension between Pashtun tribes. Of course, Pashtun, I mean, if we think about the Taliban today, the Taliban are sort of an ethno-nationalist group, a Pashtun ethno-nationalist group. And the state has always been struggled to deal with unruly Pashtun tribes, particularly in those areas, if you can sort of see in the map, just from this is from a New York Times article in 1958, which actually highlighted uh, the, this band, you can sort of see Kandahar and Kamal, that sort of whole southern part of the country, largely Pashtun, and the northeast is largely Tajik. 
So in this case, you know, essentially the, the ban went into effect because it was an ethnic minority. It went into effect because it was a, 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 a ethnic group that would not really threaten the stability of the state. And so in that sense, uh, you know, Dawood Khan was, was sort of balancing these pressures internationally and domestically, putting the policy in place in an, air, in an arena, which it wouldn't necessarily threaten the state, but also at the same time, sort of, you know, doing this, that, that it would raise the awareness and sympathy of the international community and sort of put pressure on the international community to sort of essentially, which was ultimately the goal of Dawood Khan, to get more money, get more resources from the international community to, to help in the development of Afghanistan. So it, it, this is what's really interesting about the case of Barak Shan is it kind of indicative of this, this interesting transition period where Afghanistan goes from trying to pursue a legal drug trade throughout the earlier part of the century to by the time we get to 1958, the contours and the shape of this drug trade are largely going to shift into the dimensions that, we, that are sort of more familiar to, to us now. Um, and so um, in that sense, the sort of big consequence of this, and it, just to give you an example of this, by 1960, um, it, it, Dawood Khan, so to just show you sort of the, why this is also sort of important for the, the legitimation of state power, was the farmers in Abadakshan agreed to the ban um, largely due to um, conditions that they would get economic development. Basically, the state said, we'll build, we'll build a hospital, we'll build a road, we'll build an airport, and none of that happened. And so by 1960, 61, opium sprouts up again in Badakhshan. And it, of course, really sort of symbolizes that the sort of tenuous relationship between the central state and these rural communities. Um, and, and, and again, sort of thinking about the manners in which this exacerbates or creates these tensions between sort of um, between the state and Afghan society. And that sort of, and as you sort of shift into the sort of next phase is where you end up with Afghanistan sort of emerging as um, a destination uh, for drugs. And as you sort of see here, this is a, a cartoon uh, I believe from the magazine Caravan, which was uh, one of the, the the presses that emerged in the, the 1960s in Afghanistan, sort of considered sort of a really uh, dramatic expansion of the, of the free press uh, in the country, sort of called the decade of democracy. Um, but I, I love this image because it really embodies what's going on in the 1960s, particularly, particularly in the late 1960s, when Afghanistan becomes a, a destination for for Western travelers to to get cheap, really, really potent hashish. Afghan hashish, which is referred to as chars, is really, really good. Um, you know, uh, drug enthusiasts and cannabis enthusiasts largely argue between, you know, Afghan and Moroccan hashish. Um, but I, I love this, this cartoon because you sort of see here, it, 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 literally the hippie, <laughs> as, as the cartoon described, is one holding sort of this like chalice, basically says, you know, I'm bringing this memory home with me. And the police officer says, no, you're not, it's not a memory, it's, your, it's, 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 it's hashish, it's charged. But more importantly, the stance of the police officer really sort of demonstrates what, what um, you know, this relationship and also the criticisms about the relationship between the Afghan state and drugs in the sense that, you know, the police officer kissing this, this, this hashish and this charge. And the reason why this is important is because as drugs become an important export, in this case, you know, a lot of Westerners are buying this. Many, many travelers in this period, there's a lot of literature about this, talk about, um, you know, essentially Afghanistan was sort of like the perfect place for this. Uh, it was really ideal. Um, was at, it was also at the same time, um, you know, that this didn't sit comfortably with Afghans. That the 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 Afghan state had essentially made it, you know, was allowing Westerners to come in, and that this this was what Afghanistan was becoming was a sort of haven for Western tourists and drug seekers, essentially. But also, why that's big is um, is Af the, the the character of this trade shifts and alters uh, quite a bit. Um, and this is a, a sort of map that comes from my book, but is that not only, so we, we sort of have these two trades that are emerging, um, you, know, all, all, you know, the opium trade, which really in the 50s is increasing and largely going towards Iran. Um, but the hash trade is, is now starting to connect and the, it, Afghanistan to destinations west. And as a result of this, what, what starts to occur in the 1970s is larger quantities of drugs are confiscated and even just the, the, uh, the, the sort of character of these people changes. And in essence, um, Terry Burke, who's sort of the first major sort of counter drug agent uh, in Afghanistan, sort of commented that the difference here was it was no longer sort of hippies showing up to get high and seek enlightenment. It was now entrepreneurs. It was now people that were coming 
really with the explicit purpose to buy these drugs and bring it back. And the markup, of course, is because these drugs are so cheap, was really, really quite significant. Um, and so in that sense, what I see is, is important here is that this becomes sort of a, a critical point in which Afghanistan starts to be entangled in this drug trade, in the global drug trade. And also, as the global drug trade starts to shift in the 1970s, I mean, this is a sort of critical point with Nixon's war on drugs and the Controlled Substances Act and also sort of the, the, the reshaping uh, of drug control measures, is that this too is, is you know, as a result of these sort of tentacles, you know, connecting is now it's sort of globalizing the dimension of the Afghan drug trade. And in that sense, it led, leads me to what, what I thought was um, really sort of the most significant thing, which was in the last chapter of my, the substance tractor in my book, which is about the Helmand Valley. Um, and of course the Helmand Valley is, is sort of the, the most important agricultural valley in Afghanistan. It is uh, also, and we're talking now, arguably about two thirds of the opium that's produced in Afghanistan is produced in the Helmand Valley. And what I, this to me sort of embodied this whole relationship uh, between the US, Afghanistan, about the global drug trade, it sort of all sort of came to a head. And why is that the Helmand Valley became the site, the major site of US uh, diplomacy in Afghanistan. They had a, a $450 million, $450 million plus um, dollar development project to essentially create irrigation canals and dams in the Helmand Valley to take the Helmand River and turn it into a really sort of significant agricultural um, uh, place to produce crops for the global market. And what was really interesting here was that Farmers, it, 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 there's some really great stuff. Nicolata wrote about this, um, and, and 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 there's you know really interesting stuff about sort of the ideas of sort of you know developing the countryside. Turn this is, becomes the way in which Afghanistan captures sort of this green revolution and sort of uh, agricultural development, and become you know can and, and become a major exporter of these goods. But what was interesting here is in the 1970s, disruptions in the legal markets over particularly wheat and also disruptions in the illicit market, uh, also for opium, start to make opium into uh, an important good. And why this is really important is if you look at these pictures here, these were taken um, inside a USAID zone of which were, there were certain segments of the Helmand Valley that were designated and were essentially where, you know, uh, U.S. consultants and USAID basically sort of trained and worked to irrigate and better irrigate and better produce crops was that opium started to sprout up and, the, and more importantly, really sort of outside the zone. But if you really think about the symbolism of it, this was huge. I mean, it was, you know, we're talking 1972, Nixon's in power where, you know, the war on drugs has been established. And here you have in Afghanistan, Afghan farmers growing opium in an area either in or in proximity to U.S., aid and development, which of course was trickling its way down, whether it was directly through resources or indirectly through knowledge and resources, to then be grown, turned and processed into heroin to, you know, possibly then be injected into the arms of people in the United States. I mean, it's just a PR nightmare. Um, so it was, it was a fascinating example of the manners in which Afghanistan was all of a sudden emerging in this global market as all of these major shifts are occurring. And what's also important about this is that the 1970s, particularly the mid 1970s is when Afghanistan starts to, the, the political tumult in the country starts to become a really big issue. Of course, 1973, Mohammed Daoud Khan starts his sort of lean left, uh, essentially, uh, you know, basically deposes uh, Zahir Shah. Uh, and by the time he gets to 1978, Afghanistan essentially becomes a, a Soviet satellite state. Um, so, you, you know, and, and internally, it's, it's really divisive. And what's important about this is Hellman starts to produce more and more quantities of these drugs. And that instability becomes a feature of which the drug trade grows. And of course, the prices become attractive for farmers. And so in, in a really, I guess, sort of sad irony um, is that the United States were quite successful in teaching Afghan farmers were, or were successful in teaching Afghan farmers to grow for the global market but they just could not anticipate that the global market would ultimately shift towards illicit drugs and illicit opium. And so in that sense, it was uh, just a uh, you know, really sort of uh, 
you know, typified sort of this broader sort of history that that I was um, sort of getting at. So I'm gonna, uh, so I'm just gonna sort of wrap it up here and sort of the conclusion because I am I am sort of approaching here. I think I'm at about 45. So, um, in just in terms of the most basic thing, I think some of the lessons, sort of conclusions that I got from this is sort of in one case this is a this is sort of the other side of globalization and sort of you know uh, going off uh, you know von Schendel and Abraham's pieces about sort of the idea of globalization largely being Starbucks and 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 Pringles and Coca Cola that, that this is this is this is the other side of globalization that this that Afghanistan is is finding capital and development in ways that are outside of sort of the the, the sort of formal global system. Um, the other things about this is that the lines between the state and crime are blurred. And I see this in the chapters where I talk about um, the increasing drug control measures that were established in the 1970s um, when uh, the UN sends a series of narcotics advisors and also sort of the, the DEA has its own uh, figures and increasingly larger sort of figures that are working on counter narcotics programs is on the outside, this stuff was, you know, you know, they're fighting drugs and they're gonna do what they can and seizures go up almost every year in 1970s. Um, the problem with this is that so too was production and Pakistan is, at the same time is also uh, a major producer of drugs. But what was big about this is, I guess on a granular level, is that it was a real challenge to convince Afghan police and the gendarmerie to really wholeheartedly embrace these forms of drug control. And, and a lot of this sort of fits along the, along the contours of Afghan political culture, particularly at the rural levels, whereby if you sort of think about it this way, uh, you know, the Afghan police and the gendarmes, these are some of the lowest level, you know, social, you know, civic employees, they're, they're paid virtually nothing. And they're being tasked with suppressing uh, an increasingly influential drug trade that is also lucrative. And so not only was there sort of an issue of corruption based off of greed, but there was also the idea that, you know, would, you know, police officers and gendarmes in rural areas on the Afghan Iranian border pick up a gun and fight drug traffickers when they had more in common with those drug traffickers than with the, the, the state, which was encouraging them to suppress the drug trade. Um, and so in that sense, the, the, the ability to, to actually crack down was, was really limited by essentially the state and, and in essence sort of the structure of the state and the limitations of the Afghan state. And this of course is where I think there's really sort of parallels with today is the, the inability of this. Of course, Terry Burke has a really uh, great line where he says, you know, um, essentially sort of commenting with one of the police officers that, that, that even in their training of police officers and gendarmes, they basically feel like they're just training better drug traffickers because they know that there's limitations to what they're doing. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is, is sort of thinking about the manners in which drug control shapes what's happening in Afghanistan, you know, thinking about what happened in Badakhshan, thinking about the manners in which, and this is sort of, you know, thinking about sort of James Scott work and, and trying to think, you know, in 1974, Mohammed Daoud Khan launches a you know, eradication of opium and Helmand and, and farmers largely comply, not so much they comply because they agree with it, but they comply one, because they're worried about the threat of violence, but maybe two more importantly, is that they're also aware, aware of the fact that next year, the price of opium will be even higher. So it actually works in some cases that, well, that's all right, we'll, we'll comply. We'll actually get something out of the state this year. And next year, the price for opium will be even more. So we'll just do it next year. Um, so that was, you know, these sort of entanglements and sort of these, these lines that were sort of blurred. And I think ultimately when I when sort of ruminating and sort of thinking about sort of the role of governance in Afghanistan and the ways in which drug control and even the drug trade fit into this was, um, was not, again, sort of thinking about, in this case, like the illicit drug trade as sort of juxtaposed with governance as like cops and robbers, bad guys and good guys, but linked. All right, and sort of thinking about this as not, because you know, I, I, to go back to sort of the contemporary, there's sort of this idea that the illicit drug trade is kind of the cause of instability, the cause of violence, but also to think about it as a symptom of political instability and as a symptom of violence and as a symptom of the, the issues in which people become dependent on this. And so this is ultimately for me, was sort of thinking about is, is are drugs the problem or ultimately, are we thinking about this in the wrong way? Are drugs the solution? 
to the issues of Afghanistan are in, in, in that sense. Um, and that's where, you know, and I'm sure we'll have questions about this, where I think with the contemporary stuff, there's a lot of really good work. And I, I, for me, Dave Mansfield sort of the, the vast, and I think sort of thinking about the manners in which drugs is a symptom, but also, you know, the idea of, of that for people in rural Afghanistan that are dealing with these huge changes in the global economy and domestic economy and, and the issues of the state and the formation of state and the, the exertion of state power is that drugs can be a problem, yes, but they can also be a solution. And that, that has to be sort of part of how we sort of think this. So uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop and, and I guess open it up to, to, to questions. I hope I didn't talk too long. I did all right, I guess. Thanks, James. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. And I have uh, a ton of questions of my own. But before yeah. before I um, ask you the, the most burning question that I have, um, uh, I just want to remind everybody in the audience that we're, you know, we're excited for audience questions. So there's two ways to ask. You can drop your questions directly into the chat and I can ask them for you, or you can use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask James uh, a question directly. And I have a, a direct question for, for you, James. Um, and, and it's sort of... Um, uh, a bigger picture question, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. Why do you think that there was so little attention to the historical roots of opium in Afghanistan prior to your book? Like you mentioned that there's a huge volume of literature um, on opium in Afghanistan, but yeah. only um, basically your book on sort of the deep history of opium. So why why the, the, the lacuna, I guess? Why the absence of literature prior to your book? Yeah, good question, yeah. Um, I think some of it's the war. I think some of it is, you know, you, you basically have uh, uh, an incredibly violent conflict. I mean, if you think about the Afghan Soviet war, you talk about, you know, one and a half million Afghans die. You talk about six million refugees. I mean, it's really uh, a, a, an incredibly violent conflict. And then if you sort of think about essentially, you know, the period of the rise of the Taliban um, is, is, yeah, undoubtedly a chaotic, lawless, stateless place. I mean, when the Taliban emerged, I mean, this is sort of the, you know, the, the problem that the Taliban um, represented was, you know, their origin was largely to stabilize the country. And, and you know, you know they, they largely were basically a community watch program that, that, that prevented uh, death and chaos and marauders and criminal organizations. And so, you know, in that sense, you know, you had just, you know, literally physical destruction. I mean, Afghanistan, there's just physically, you know, destroyed and just the trauma of it. And also, I think sort of the pre-existing elements of which there, there, there were issues with, with the state, you know, Afghanistan, you know, there's, it was never colonized formally. You know, Afghanistan was a buffer state between the British and the Russians and, um, you know, I mean, I've had this argument before with other people, but, you know, there, there's something for sort of, you know, I guess sort of like the fetish for documentation that came with colonization, right? That was sort of like part of the sort of massive, you know, system that was put in place. Um, and, and so in that sense, um, there was never sort of like a culture of documentation, which was a big challenge there. And even just in terms of, of doing this research, you know, at the, the, the National Archives, um, you know, just there... It's just, you know, I mean, literally the basement was, I mean, I, I, it was just stacks of papers. I mean, there was no, or it was very, I mean, they've actually, they've apparently gotten better, but it was just stacks of papers. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> that ranged from, you know, it was like, where do I start? I don't even know where to start. So, um, so th there were just a lot of impediments to, to why this was going on. This is part of the reason why, if you really sort of think about the discipline uh, that has emerged is that, you know, anthropologists is sort of, you know, in the last 20 years really sort of defined and helped us understand Afghanistan because that's really sort of been our only sort of lens into it. Um, and then sort of outside stuff um, is, you know, British, you know, documents and whatnot. Um, but really sort of the, the, that period during the war, there was just no emphasis. And I also think that there was so much money put into post 9-11 Afghanistan, I mean, billions of dollars. I mean, what does the Watson Institute say? Like what, $6 trillion have been put into the United States war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and I think in Yemen. I mean, that's $6 trillion, it seems. And, you know, so the money, you know, people fought, probably followed the money, which, you know, and, and we obviously didn't get into the business for that. You know? So, um, it, it, you know, so, um, you know, I think there were just, there were a lot of things that, that sort of prevented sort of this, this, analysis of sort of the historical features of it, so. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's actually my, my, my next question for you is just if you could talk about the process of doing, like physically doing research, um, you know, for your dissertation or for any kind of historical study in a country that's seen four decades of war. And I think, um, you know, I just think back to the picture that you opened with of, of, the, of the building and the, the, the um, image that you just described for us of sort of going into the basement of the National Archives and it just being stacks and stacks of paper. So what was that like for, for you? Um, heavily caffeinated. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of, a lot of tea, a lot of drinking, you know, a lot of drinking tea and waiting. Um, yeah, I mean, it was an interesting process for me, um, and sort of a roundabout process for me because I really started, um, really sort of with the U.S. archives was sort of the beginning for me where I actually started to find stuff, and that was sort of I, I built in that direction. But in Afghanistan, I, I think the most notable feature of doing research about this, which is actually one of the things that I. I I had some really interesting conversations about this was that the the current issue of of the drug trade permeated every discussion that I had. I mean it was it, it was it was part of everything we talked about and and took a lot of explaining for me to be like no I'm a, I'm a historian and I'm trying to learn I want to know the history of it. And there was you know and this there was there was almost sort of this like defense mechanism that was in place um this idea that that some of these people that I interviewed were, were kind of on the defensive, like, look, like, w w you know, it's not our fault. Like, you know, it, uh, an often retort was that, you know, drug addiction wasn't a problem in Afghanistan until 2001, which is partially true. And really in terms of magnitude, really post 9-11, the, the rates of drug addiction in Afghanistan have, have increased um, dramat uh, you know, dramatically. Um, and it, it was one of those things where it, it was, I always had to try to distinguish between, well, I, I get that. I'm trying to figure out what happened before, what happened before. And it, that was a really big struggle for me. And honestly, it took up most of the time was it almost always ended up getting in discussions about what was happening now and what was happening with drug addiction. And, you know, being in Kabul, you know, addictions pretty obvious, um, you know, just sitting in traffic, you know, Kabul is a huge city in South Asia. So if any of you travel to Asia, you sit in traffic wherever you go. Um, and, you know, there were addicts everywhere. And, and I spent, it was interesting too, because um, I spent a lot of time trying to be like, look, like you, this isn't a problem just Afghanistan is facing. Like I was like showing, you know, friends of mine were like showing pictures. I'm like, look, this is in Boston, like where I work and like, look at, look at, how much of an issue drugs is there? They're like in America, I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. And the idea was to, to ultimately, and I think to sort of go back to kind of like one of the big points in, in, is that this problem that it, uh, Afghanistan is, is not like, a, there's no, like, there's no solution for Afghanistan that can do by itself. Like this is like, ultimately the drug trade is clearly tied globally. And what's happening in terms of addiction is is connected to what's happening in so many other parts of the world. Not even just what we talked about the last couple of weeks in terms of the United States. I mean, you know, uh, there's been some great work about Iran and what's happening in Iran. And I mean, of course, in India is having a massive explosion in opioid use. And I think sort of one of the things that I was always trying to sort of emphasize was, you know, I'm trying to understand why we're here but I'm not, I'm not blaming Afghanistan. Like I, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to blame Afghanistan. There was, all, and again, there was always sort of a defense mechanism that was sort of put up that took a lot of explaining um, to, to sort of get into. And once, once I sort of found a groove, there was a groove where, um, and it was particularly when I was doing, you know, the AREU, which is in Kabul is really fantastic place for doing research. And they had some really great stuff. And that was, once you sort of found the place, you were like, Oh, like, that's it. I'm going to go there. And, and, I'll take advantage of it. But there was, there were, a, there was a lot of tea drinking and sitting around and not talking about what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and so did you know um, as uh, you know this so this project was born um, out of your dissertation, right? And so did you know um, you know when you flew to Afghanistan where you wanted to look, or did you discover that as you were there that kind of unfolded through those conversations and, and tea drinking? Uh, a little bit of both. So uh, 2014 uh, is when I was there. And um, so this was not a great period. Uh, and of course, it's even gotten worse. Um, this was during the election, the last election when Ashraf Ghani was, was there was a, a, you know, basically the election ended in April and the decision lasted until September uh, over who would be president. And it was, uh, it was pretty chaotic period to be there. Um, so um, there was, there was not a lot of free roaming for me it was uh it was 
um, you going here and going there and coming back. There was not um, there was not a lot of opportunities for me to sort of venture out and 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 explore um, in that way. But that, I think that ended up, you know, I, I did this through um, essentially, uh, you know, through BU uh, and, and, um, right. and for the African Ameri the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies, um, and um, and they really have an awesome team that were working with me on a daily basis about who to talk to. And, and of course, you know, this, there was really interesting stuff too, because who I wanted to talk to also, like, you know, if I was interviewing a Pashtun, I couldn't have a Tajik. I had to have a Pashtun, you know, introduce mm. me. And, so, and there were, there were a lot of little sort of minor nuances to it that um, required um, time. And so there, there was that aspect of it. Um, and then I also think too, being an American not in the military was both interesting because it was many people were sort of like, what? Like, why are you here? And you don't like, you're not in, like, you're not in the, and I'm like, no, I'm a historian. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm a, like, I study history. And um, it was, uh, it, 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 again, like a lot of the conversations ended up being, hey, I, I had, a, the last day I was there, I went to uh, Boge Babur, which is the, the park of the great Mughal Emperor Babur. Beautiful park. Um, and, you know, and it was just crazy. I mean, I was there for like seven hours talking with people about being American. It was really just sort of like fascinating stuff, but there uh, wasn't a lot of time to, to sit in the archives and sort of filter through because there were just mm -hmm. a lot of barriers to that. Yeah, this this kind of sounds. It kind of seems um, like like the almost like a movie, like you're describing. Like I could just imagine you sort of trying to navigate these networks in Afghanistan and explain the con, you know, to to folks that um, what 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 it is that you're getting at, uh, and that it's not necessarily connected to the U.S. military project in Afghanistan. And um, it, it's just really interesting. And I can ask you a thousand questions about this, and we can revisit this later. I have another methodological question for you, but we have some great a uh, couple of great questions from our uh, audience here. The first one is from Ian Smith. Um, and he points out um, sort of this contradiction. Uh, he's based in Scotland. And so mm -hmm. he points out um, sort of the contradiction. And I think that you kind of mentioned um, a, a similar contradiction in your book between uh, about the US. But um, so anyways, Ian points out the, the contradiction that um, at the same time that the UK is supplying troops to help police the drug trade in Afghanistan, um, Afghan uh, heroin derived from Afghan opium is ending up in the streets uh, of Glasgow. And so the, his question is, um, did the Afghan state acknowledge this tension and, and try to counter it? Um, uh, are you are you aware of this? And could you speak more about this? Um, I tried to avoid the Afghan state as much as possible. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I tried uh, literally to to avoid um, the state. The, the only time that I, I really was interacting with the Afghan state was with the Ministry of Interior and their narcotics division, but that was it. But even then it was, the, the, you know, I didn't actually go to, to the ministry, but um, no, I, I, this was of course sort of the beauty of working with the AIS was that uh, my colleagues were helping me. We were like, nope, no, you know, like you don't, you don't want to get involved. There was some pressure. I guess one of the interesting things when I was doing the research, particularly in the, the national archives, um, it was kind of funny in hindsight, but there was um, there was this this idea that because I was a Westerner seeking documents, those documents must be very valuable, and I had to sort of convince them like like not really like, and there there and and there were the, the museum director uh, was trying really hard to sort of convince them that like no like you don't get this, but there was there was that was another three or four days of being where the people that were actually sort of like you know providing access to these documents wouldn't because essentially they wanted payment and they were like you know if if this person flew from america to get these documents they must be i mean there, there's got to be something here to it um and i really sort of stressing that like no like definitely definitely not um but it took a while for that but in terms of the afghan state and these narratives now I, I i really did try my hardest to avoid the state this was also 2014 is when the Taliban shifted their policy uh, to essentially with the you know, Ruba face to face, which was that the state was the target of violence, which has sort of been the norm between Afghan government and the Taliban sense. Uh, and, 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 and basically, like a lot of the civilian violence now is sort of the, the Afghan version of ISIS, uh, you know, uh, Islamic State of Khorasan province. So 
um, there was like, there was like a, a legitimate reason to be, you know, a police cars coming down the street, sort of like pull over, get out of the way. And, and so I avoided the state as much as possible. Um, I think the reluctance that I got was really from people that I interviewed who were civilians and, and, and professors and workers and who, again, the, the issue for them was me asking about the Afghan drug trade as an American and this idea that it was, it was sort of their fault. Um, and, 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 you know, again, sort of having to sort of counter that narrative is sort of being like, look, like I, that, that's I, like, I, I, it's not your fault, you know, um, so, yeah, that's that. I'm sure that this was an immensely tough obstacle to to overcome. But I think the you know the book is is the book is so great in its evidence that um, you know a lot of these barriers you found really creative ways to overcome them. So um, that that's uh, I think that I was just kind of blown away by the research that went into the book. Um, so I guess I guess that's my way of you know congratulating you on a, a fantastic research project. Thank but, you. Um, we have so so we have another question from from David Courtright, and it's a sort of a follow up question on um, the previous question from Ian Smith. And so um, David asks um, about opiate addiction and some of the taboos um, uh, against opiate addiction in the the culture uh, in Afghanistan. So David asks, when did the early taboos against domestic um, opiate use erode? So so you write about this in the book. Like, um, um, could you could you speak more about um, when opiate addiction? became more widespread in Afghanistan, domestic opiate addiction, and how um, that cultural transformation took place? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, a great question. So I, I think it's really interesting in the hi historical elements of it. So there, there's sort of two ways in which essentially sort of linguistically distinguishing between drug, you know, opium as a medicine and as a drug. So Mavad Mukder is, is drug, Dawa is medicine. And it, oh, those little subtle features of describing opium either as Dawa or as Mavad Mokder kind of implies sort of, you know, your, how you understand the drug, right? Like you either see it as a medicine or, or as, as like a drug. Um, so what's interesting about this is I don't find a lot of evidence of opium abuse in the 1970s. In fact, it, it, the, the very little evidence that I actually have of, of sort of like issues with, with health <laughs> largely revolved around alcohol. And some of this, of course, probably stems from the fact that, you know, it's, it's largely forbidden substance. Um, and of course, you know, alludes to the Russian presence of which the Russians were, were pretty big in terms of smuggling alcohol into, into, into Afghanistan. Cannabis was, is, cannabis was and still is really sort of the predominant drug of choice for Afghans. There's, there's less stigma around it. David McDonald wrote about this in Drugs in Afghanistan. This book came out, I think, in 2007. Um, and, and certainly there, there's, you know, more research. I think a lot of this really does stem from the trauma of the war. I mean, I think the UN estimates what, like 90% of the Afghan population suffer from some element of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, mm -hmm. and so in that sense, uh, you know, I think, you know, and this goes to, of course, David's phenomenal work that he pointed at addicts who survived and forces of habit. Um, uh, about, you know, the manners in which people cope with life by using drugs. I mean, I, you know, I, I still, by the way, David, I still use addicts who survived for my classes and we focus on that issue, right? Like what, what you know, we kind of do the drug set and setting thing. Like what, what is compelling people to be drug addicts? And I think in Afghanistan, it's a very similar thing. Like it's what, what's happened since 1979 is, is trauma. I mean, it's just traumatizing what the Afghans have gone through and, and, in that sense, the availability of this drug in some cases makes sense. And, I, and um, I, I, there, was, there was actually a documentary that came out a couple uh, years ago called Layla at the Bridge, which is to, actually Ian uh, Smith just asked this question. Um, and I, I would encourage you to check it out because it's a, um, I can't remember her last name, but Layla is one of the, she's sort of like one of the rogue uh, drug treatment centers, and she's a really incredible woman and passionate. There's an area of Kabul called Pula Charka, which is really like sort of the central area of drug addiction in Kabul, and it's like you, know, you can sort of like smell it when you get close. Um, and and you know, the thing about this is that a lot of the people that have succumbed to drug addiction were people that in 2003, 2004, 2005 worked for this huge international system. I mean, Kabul is, I mean. You just it's like the, the imprint of the international community is just in your face. I mean, the U.S. Embassy is huge. I mean, it's the most militarized city in the world, maybe next to Baghdad. I mean, it's just huge. And just in, you know, in, in the early 2000s, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of Westerners and, and, and people from around the world trying to rebuild Afghanistan. There's a ton of money being put in. 
And gradually over the course of the last decade and a half, that money has been withdrawn from the country and people have lost their jobs and there's just nothing, there's just not a lot for people to do. And so in this case, it, it, you know, it almost mirrors what you see in post-industrial Ohio, Indiana, and these other places where people lose their job, they lose their purpose, they lose their hope. They turn to these drugs uh, as, a, as a result of this. And in terms of like drug treatment, Ian, there's, there, there's, there's just, there's such, there's very little healthcare in Afghanistan. Like the, the, there's just not a lot. There's just, there's, you know, this is a huge issue. Um, I mean, to give you an example, just to sort of show you doctors without borders, which has had a, you know, very conflicted relationship with the Taliban as well as the U S military, the Taliban have accepted doctors without borders because they recognize the necessity of healthcare, <laughs> you know, which sort of gives you a sense about just like how little healthcare there actually is in the country. And so in that sense, there's just, there's not a lot, a lot of people are essentially self-medicating, the availability of drugs is there. Um, and there's just not a lot of hope for people to get off of these drugs. And I think, you know, when you sort of think about sort of, you know, I've been, unfortunately within my own family, you know, ha have seen what drug addiction can do and been fortunate about this, that, you know, person, you know, my sibling is, you know, seven years clean is, that that person had support, had resources, and still took, you know, four years to 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 get off heroin. Imagine, you know, without without any of that, right? I mean, it doesn't exist. So, I mean, th there's an element of sort of hopelessness and despair that sort of undergirds this, and and that and it's certainly sort of depressing and sad to see. Um, I, I think in the face of that, and if, if you see Layla at the bridge, uh, the documentary, um, and sort of search her up because she's kind of become sort of a media star. She 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 sort of she's really outspoken in her criticisms of the Afghan government, um, and you know, some people sort of question her intentions. Is she like doing it for publicity and whatnot? But I, I think I, I think that's a little unfair. Um, is that the only people that are really doing it are, are people like Layla? They're, they're people that are offering these these forms of drug treatment, but it's not enough. I mean, it's not enough. And you're not only talking about heroin, which is more common in the cities, but Opium is smoked commonly in rural areas. It's, you know, and, and there's high rates of, of, of opium and heroin use among women. Um, so there's, again, it's, it's, you know, how people cope is they use drugs to cope. And in this case, it's really sort of indictment about sort of what's, what's unfolded in Afghanistan over, over the last sort of 40 years. And so, so um, uh, about um, sort of the gendered lines of, of opiate uh, use in Afghanistan is, so I, I recall reading, I can't remember the, the venue, it was like the Atlantic or, or something um, like that, uh, an article a few years ago that was kind of like a deep dive into opiate consumption in a, a family in Afghanistan. Um, and the article made the point that, um, uh, or tried to make the point, and I have no idea whether or not this is true. So this is you know, that's part of the question that I'm asking is, is this true? Um, the article made the point that opiate abuse was mainly a male problem and that it was having pretty dramatic effects on um, Afghani families uh, along those lines that, that you could imagine. Um, do, do you find that that's the case? Um, I think that might be a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I I think a lot of this is 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 not so much like drug use, but I think it's like what they're using. I think heroin is be is 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 more common now than it was. I mean, heroin really wasn't widely used prior to this, and of course, during the Taliban, even though the Taliban tentatively endorsed the production of opium, there were relatively strict uh, you know penalties for consumption, uh, and obviously, some people sort of circumvented that, um, but. Um, I think with what's happened with women is that, you know, and this is of course sort of the challenge of understanding this, particularly at like rural levels in Afghanistan without like a, you know, solid state system in which you have sort of a lot of information is, you know, people have consumed raw opium in Afghanistan for long periods of time. And it's quite common for people to have, you know, a plant or two or several plants, largely as a medicine, right? It's an anti-diuretic drug. I mean, it's going to save your life if you get, you, you know, you get malaria or dysentery or something like that. Um, so it was common for people to have it. The question then becomes, you know, when do people start using it and abusing it? And there, you know, during the nineties and really in the two thousands, women were smoking opium. And then as, as that shift in use, you start to see the shift into heroin consumption. Um, and what, what's also really quite amazing in a terrible way is not only have we seen sort of this evolution in the drug market now, 
it's now shifting towards methamphetamine. I mean, it's literally the, the Afghan drug production market's like diversifying, um, whereby those producers who are either have the resources to expand or those that are struggling to gain entry into the, the, the heroin trade are now shifting to methamphetamine because there's a local plant, Dave Mansfield wrote about this recently. Um, and we're literally, they, they're, they can manufacture ephedrine out of this plant and they're now becoming a major producer of amphetamine. And, and interestingly enough, it, it, it's kind of very similar to what's happened in the US is people medicate and self-treat, right? Heroin's a downer. Uh, well, I'll start using meth because it's an upper. Maybe that will get me off of the drug. And of course, we're just you know substituting one one addiction you know essentially for another. And of course, that's a that's a relatively nascent thing. Um, but um, you know, it, it, it's it's just sort of gives you a sense about how much drugs have really sort of taken hold in in this country. But I would I, I think again, so I'm always sort of cautious about this because there's always such like a heavy emphasis on Afghanistan. Like I would say just how, like how much drugs are prevalent, like every, like everywhere. Like we just like, it's, you know, this is, this is, this is a, you know, we use a lot of drugs like, and, and it's, you know, a glo it's a global problem. And Afghanistan is sort of a prime example of it, but it's a global problem in that sense. Yeah, and this has been one of the consistent themes throughout the previous weeks of, of criminars as well, is that drug use, uh, drug, uh, for, for various reasons, and, and you know, uh, but, but drug use is high kind of uh, everywhere or in a lot of places, it seems, um, yeah. uh, and a lot of moments in history, too. So that's a really good point. Um, I, I'm in, so I'm especially interested in the social history of, of opium in Afghanistan, but I want to switch gears just a little bit. And so what is life like for an opium farmer? Um, over in the last couple of decades in Afghanistan. So we've talked a lot about opiate use. We've talked about sort of um, the, the role of Afghanistan in the global drug economy. But what is a day-to-day, -day, what is the day-to-day -day life um, of an Afghan opium farmer uh, mm -hmm. like? Um, so uh, it sort of depends on where you are in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some great work, you know, go back to Mansfield, but also uh, Paul Fishstein, Jonathan Goodhand, there's been some really, really great work uh, on this sort of rural livelihoods approaches to, to what's unfolded. Um, for some, it's, you know, hard. Um, and I think it's sort of one of those, uh, those things that I, I know Dave Mansfield very well, and I, I, I really, you know, have hold him in the highest regard. Um, but when we sort of talked about sort of rational choices and a lot of Afghan farmers make, it's, it's a rational choice, right? And in some cases they make a rational choice to not grow opium uh, you know, and, and, you know, uh, the variety of forces at play, like why do they decide to grow or why do they decide to grow something else? Um, and, um, and sort of thinking about, about that. So for, for a lot of farmers, it, it, there is this element. I think one of the other things about this that, and I even sort of talk about this in the introduction of my book is, you know, there were, there were a bunch of books that came out in 2006 and 2007, which really sort of, you know, jumped on like the Taliban narrative and that they're extracting money and that it was really coercive. And then there was the whole thing about the opium brides and whatnot. And that's not to say that it doesn't exist. Um, and that the Taliban aren't dry, you know, driving revenue from you know, the taxes that they're charging on the trafficking and whatnot. But it, it's, it's not as uniform as people think. It's much more, it, 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 it really sort of depends on where they are. I think there's like, you know, even just sort of thinking about the Taliban as like a cohesive force is almost kind of problematic because for, for, you know, a save for sort of a dedicated sort of cadre, the vast majority of, uh, of people that on the outsides of the Taliban, it's sort of like transactional. It's sort of like, well, what are you getting from me today? And what can I get out of this tomorrow? Hmm. And if it doesn't work, then I might shift my allegiance. And that same thing is expressed for farmers often as sort of thinking about, well, what's the best and most advantageous position for them? And I think in some cases, it kind of comes back to like the state um, is the state has at some times done things to help farmers and, and, but it's very limited. I mean, it, it, like, you know, the question of like, you know, the, the supremacy of opium as a product, you know, how are you going to convince thousands of farmers to grow saffron, which is really the only agricultural product that rivals, you know, opium in terms of its profit potential. Um, you know, but unless like the world starts eating massive quantities of like paella or something else, like, you know, you're not going to see the demand for this product really sort of increase in, 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 in that sort of way. So it, there's, there's limitations to it. And while people are, and, and it's not to say that like that can't happen, it's, 
it's a struggle. Now, what's the other interesting thing that's happened more recently is that drugs have become a way for people to enrich themselves. I mean, they're actually seeing, you know, sales of solar panels, flat screen TVs, and then uh, sort of, you know, literally land cruisers, which is sort of like a testament to wealth in Asia, right, is the Toyota land cruiser, um, that the sales of these are starting, and there's, there's evidence of this, you know, growing in these areas that are sort of densely producing opium. So um, there's a, you know, for some farmers, it's tough. Other farmers, this is a, a really a way out of poverty. Yeah, and I think, you know, this reminds me of one of the parallels that gets discussed um, in regard to Mexico and the production of, of opium and heroin in Mexico is that it's, for a lot of people, it's a way to just uh, survive, right? To find, you know, just to, to fund the basic realities of, of, of life, right? And so um, that, that's, that's really interesting. So um, Luke asks a question about a, a figure who has been a recurring figure, you know, throughout the past few weeks uh, of the criminal and just someone who looms really large anytime we're talking about 20th century uh, U.S. drug policy, and that's Harry Anslinger, right? Um, so, so could you just you, you write about Harry Anslinger in your book? Um, and I think that was really intriguing to Luke, to myself, and I'm sure uh, a lot of other folks as well. Um, what was Anslinger's role in the opium and in, in the opium trade in Afghanistan? And could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's for me. That's sort of like the way I sort of frame the talk around sort of those two phases. Um, you know, for. Anslinger was sort of looming over Afghanistan's potential entry into the legal drug trade, right? And it's for him, it's, it's, you know, you need to demonstrate, you need to demonstrate control, you need to demonstrate that you that producers have, you know, everything that's produced is accounted for and whatnot. Um, so for him, he, but he's also, this is why I thought was really interesting when we get to the Badakhshan issue in 57, 58, is that he also becomes sympathetic to Afghanistan. It's kind of like, well, like, they're really poor, like, maybe they need this. Um, and like, maybe we're a little bit, which is also really weird because, you know, however much I've read about Enzinger, I don't really like the guy from whatever, you know, I'm like, this guy's really don't like him, but he was also, he kind of shows us like, well, this actually makes sense, right? Like maybe we should sort of think about this. And this is where you get into sort of the politics of it, where Iran's really sort of pressuring them to be like, look, like Afghan opium is a problem in our country. It's a free for all please do something like, do not let them become a legal producer. And there's also sort of, you know, obviously, you know, Iran doesn't want Afghanistan to be a rival in the, in the production of opium too, in that sense. So Hanslinger looms large in that way. And I think you know, makes a decision and, and kind of influences and sort of forces Afghanistan into that sort of prohibitive model that they've, they've sort of adopted and, and, and embraced over the last sort of half century. Of course, flawed and, and limited and, and, and all of those other ways. I don't know if that answers so, 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 so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it reminds me of, of, of sort of a current events question and we're, we're starting to run out of time, so I'll keep it brief mm -hmm. here, but what do you expect? Uh, it's almost unfair to ask you to predict the future, but since you're, you're the expert on this topic, what do you um, expect that the departure of US troops from Afghanistan, which is happening right now, will mean for the for the opium economy in Afghanistan? Do you, do you expect anything to change or do you expect more of, of yeah, some more continuity than change? <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think you'll see more continuity. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, again, I mean, you know, the, the demand for these drugs is there. I think you, you, mm -hmm. I think the question will be, you know, I think there will be a question about, you know, the, these outside groups like the Taliban and what ways will they like wholesale embrace sort of the taxation of the trade and actually try to take it over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and will there be resistance from farmers and traffickers? Because I, I think that's a, another sort of misnomer. Is some of the stuff that sort of come out of, of sort of the beltway, you know, uh, work is sort of this idea that the Afghan drug trade is sort of a centralized, vertically integrated system, which I mean, you could even argue, is it in that in any way, right? Like, does it act, does that even exist? But in Afghanistan is such a decentralized country that you know, it's really hard to make that. Maybe in the north, there's there's examples of sort of opium warlords and whatnot. But I think it's going to be interesting to sort of see how this plays out domestically. But I don't see it changing anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, and like I said, I think for 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 many Afghans in rural Afghanistan, it's it is the solution hmm. as of right now. And unless there's a better solution, this is the solution. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's a really great point to take away. Like, you know, we, 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 so so often the conversation about drugs in Afghanistan or, or international drug wars 
um, frames drugs as as a problem. But for, for a lot of people involved in the production, um, lower level, you know, farmers, things like that, it can be a solution um, too. So mm -hmm. that's a, an interesting it's a puzzle to sort of wrap your mind around. Um, at least for me, it is. Well, this has been a really great conversation. I'm so sad to say that we're starting to run out of time. Um, but uh, again, I want to encourage everyone to, to check out the book, Poppy's uh, Politics and Power. It's fantastic. And um, with that, I'll bring in Claire, uh, who is going to close us out. Um, let's say thanks once again to Dr. Bradford for this excellent talk. Thank you, and, everybody. Um, and thank you all for your engagement and your wonderful questions. Um, next week is our very last Kreminar of the season, um, and it will be uh, journalist Maya Solovitz, and she'll be talking about her new or forthcoming book, which is about the history of harm reduction, and she will be in conversation with Dr. Carolyn Acker, who um, is both, both a historian of drugs and someone who has a personal history with harm reduction, um, as a, a, was a leader in a leader in that movement as well. Um, so we hope that you will all join us again next week, same place, same time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.